All right. Next, I'd like to introduce Tim Burke, the co-founder and CTO of Arch Systems. Tim leads a team of experienced data and manufacturing experts who build next generation products that deeply understand manufacturing processes and surface intelligent actions to automatically improve them. Tim is a recipient of the Forbes 30 Under 30 Award, and he, is a pa and he is passionate about empowering people to have equal access to basic resources and ensuring that, that the next wave of IoT devices benefits all people. Let's welcome Tim to the stage for his presentation on using AI and digital twins to enhance workflow efficiency. So thank you, everyone. Um, very excited to be here and have a chance to share with you a little bit of what we do at Arch, but also reflecting some of the themes we've heard from other speakers earlier in the day. You know, specifically heard from Paul Baldessari about the opportunities for AI in discrete manufacturing with Flex. We heard from Prakash about opportunities in process industries, you know, oil and gas. Our work is in discrete manufacturing. So when you think about where to place it in the broader context, a lot of the specific challenges we'll talk about and opportunities are more appropriate in discrete, although there are analogs in the rest of industry as well. But the goal here is to talk about the link between AI and digital twin um, and how they are needed, need to evolve together and how they are inextricably linked in where you can apply AI specifically in discrete manufacturing. So with that, we'll go right into the talk. Um, you know, I think it's, it's no uh, surprise to people in this room that we're in a moment of change in manufacturing. You know, in addition to the new opportunities for AI and what you can do with AI, there's also a lot of disruption, right? Disruption caused by ge geopolitical change, by reshoring, whereas opportunities, but also um, a lot of challenges to the status quo. In particular, there's a skills gap where we can't find enough workers to work in manufacturing. The skills that they need are changing. Um, the current workforce uh, will need additional new skills. We're seeing factories being built. This is US new factory spend. In fact, you just saw a number today. It was even higher than this. Um, and these changes are leading to the need to run factories with ever, ever decreasing numbers of workers, ever decreasing number of very skilled workers in new places on dra dramatically increased complexity in manufacturing processes. So you heard from Paul Baldessari of Inflex about how the electronics manufacturing is becoming incredibly complex. Now imagine doing that in a country without a deeply experienced labor pool, hasn't built these kind of products before, being asked to do it with, with small amounts of direct labor, and perhaps not even the same number of process engineers or engineering experts you would typically expect to find in one of these, in one of these plants. That's sort of the overall scope of challenges. And then the question is, where can specifically AI help in bridging these gaps? And you know, in the past, when we talked about automation. You know, I think we heard a, a lot of people talking about this today as well. There's still a lot of opportunity for direct automation of assembly tasks. Things like robot arms, now cobots, maybe easier to use robot arms, easier to program robot arms, but really just the direct automation of the physical job of you know, assembling a piece or you know, putting together a circuit board. But if you think about a factory and the whole set of activities needed to run a factory, there is a lot of complexity around the decision-making process, around the intelligence, around the operations of how do you actually know what to assemble? How do you know how your overall factory is running? Is it efficient? How is your quality? Why is your quality low? How do you root cause that? All of the activities that are typically performed by your expert engineering staff, your operations lead, your Six Sigma folks, or your, your lean manufacturing experts. And we see an opportunity for uh, AI and specifically some of the generative AI concepts and large language models to have an impact on automating this intelligence. So being co-pilots and extending the reach of your existing experts, given that you don't already don't have enough to meet your needs and that gap is growing, not shrinking over time, how can we find opportunities to not just do direct automation, but also do the indirect automation of the intelligence and processes and process improvements that are needed to uh, run a successful, efficient factory that at the end of the day is profitable at the bottom line. And one of the... So we sort of sketch out this desired future state where in addition to all the opportunities for you know, point applications of AI in direct automation, there's this broader set of AI co-pilot that is taking in data, manufacturing data you know, from your shop floor, from your many shop floors, for example, and it is feeding it through some magical system, let's say, and sending back intelligent actions, intelligent actions that are guiding your experts, that are helping them understand best practices, maybe transferring knowledge from current 
uh, senior engineers down to uh, more junior engineers and providing this co-pilot for all these engineering teams. This is sort of the goal, but it's very challenging. I wanna talk about why it is so challenging with a couple of specific examples and also where even today, there are opportunities where this can be realized in certain scenarios and what those might be in discrete manufacturing. And in particular, you know, it's tempting to imagine that if this is what a human sees, you know, in an advanced factory, I've got all my process lines, I got my machines, my equipment, some manual assembly stations. You know, if I'm a supervisor sitting up here looking out over my factory floor, this is what I might see. Now it's tempting to imagine that an AI would see this and even more. It would see everything a person sees, but it would also see maybe all of the data from the machines. It would see all of the process equipment. It would see all of the product data. But unfortunately, that's typically not the case. The AI typically sees much less than the person sees. And why is that? Because the AI only sees things that have been digitized. It only sees the digital twin that you feed into it. And quite often discrete manufacturing, there are many stations for which the only thing that's been digitized is a red, yellow, green stoplight that famous and on light we heard about earlier today. You know, and that's, that's very important to digitize, sort of like the first thing to do. Do I have an active problem? Is there a red light or is it green? But you have a problem here because if all of your factory is green lights, that doesn't mean there's no opportunities to improve. And so there's not data in the, there's not data being fed into an AI algorithm, no matter how good or impressive it is, it's blind to the actual conditions on the ground. And in particular, you see other gaps where digitization is highly uneven. And you might have you know, 10 factory lines, nine of which have data, and the 10th has no data. That's invisible to, you, to your AI. And it could be the case that this 10th factory line is really important, that's where you have problems. You have no information on it at all. And so what we see is that there is this inextricable link between what you have in your digital twin and what you can do with that data from an analytics or an AI standpoint. And that leads to this data dilemma. Where we, we work with companies, we see oftentimes that there are many millions of dollars of, in, of wasted investment where you are trying to build AI. And we heard some examples earlier in the day about people trying to build AI, some things that worked, some things that didn't. And one of the challenges is there's a lot of data integration that's needed before you can get to the point where AI can emerge. Because it's not just about having the algorithm or having the right model. And it's not even about knowing the right use case, although they're both critically important. It's also about having the eyes and ears in the factory that can feed that model the information it needs in order to make the right decision. And this has been um, a large challenge, especially in discrete manufacturing, perhaps more so even in process industries. And so this is sort of the, the journey that enables um, AI to take off, where you start with data, where you start with data from your shop floor, you're able to collect it, you can turn it into insights. So what is the right information um, digested by experts in that elucidates the right problems about your processes, your equipment, or your, your products, and then shows you where the right improvements can be. If you could do that, then you would have a digital twin that is complex and accurate that you could apply AI to. And then the opportunity we talked about um, earlier in the day and the advanced models that are coming up, they would have the ability to be plugged into this uh, digital twin. They would see this, they would see your whole factory, not just the machines and the processes and the people, they would also see all of the invisible data inside the equipment, what it's really doing, what its processes are going on, what sensors are measuring, whatever. And they would be able to make smart decisions that they could then feed to your existing network of operators, of process engineers, of experts to take action in the factory. And even in some cases, maybe close the loop themselves with the AI automatically maybe changing a parameter. So this is very challenging to do because it requires that you uh, combine three separate domains. You have, we talked about the IT domain. There is a lot of data in these factories. You know, in particular, um, a large factory network may have five or six billion data points flowing out of it per day. It is a um, software challenge to collect all that information and put it all in one place. That's non-trivial in that set of expertise. There's all of the information from your humans, your experts in the factory that may not be written down anywhere or maybe in Excel, as we heard you know, so quite often still used by um, experts in factories. And so you have to combine people data with a software system that can get all that information into one place, put it into a corresponding digital twin. Then we talked about um, graphs. And we talked about graphs earlier today in the context of design. It also is in the context of manufacturing. You have all of these interconnected processes, each one doing their part, contributing to a whole. And you need to be able to link data across that entire process because 
you know, oftentimes it is one machine makes a problem, another machine detects a problem, or a human detects a problem. And so being able to say, this was the exact data on this machine in this step of my process, step two, that contributed to my defect found in step 15 in another building, maybe another factory around the world. How do you link those two things together is very challenging. And so, but if you can do all of this, put together your people knowledge, your process knowledge, contextualize it with the product you're building and link it together along the route at which it's flowing through your factory. Again, this is discrete manufacturing specific, but applies broadly within discrete. Um, then you will have a digital twin where you have enough information to then plug in and feed an AI algorithm, which can then feed you back intelligent actions. So this is sort of the, the setup and context. And then let's say you can do this. Let's say you have this. What are some example use cases that you could do um, that add value to your factory today and are not sort of next generation, but are possible with current uh, generative AI technologies that don't require some next step before they become practical? That's what I want to talk about now. So a couple interesting use cases. So these are ones that may not seem like the most obvious ones. I picked them because they solve pain points in factories and because they highlight what's possible with generative AI in a way that was challenging before, even with the most advanced neural network. And the first use case um, sounds kind of silly, but it's downtime labeling. So what do I mean by downtime labeling? So you know, you got a factory, you're building products, and your factory line is down. This machine is blinking red on its red light. Now, in addition, you have your operator who's running your factory line, doing a ton of things, trying to fix the problem, trying to build products, trying to resupply your equipment. They're also tasked typically with figuring out what the problem was, writing it down, maybe on a spreadsheet or clipboard. After they're done fixing the problem, running probably to another computer somewhere else in the factory and typing into a spreadsheet. Why? Because that's the only way for you to know what your Pareto of downtime reasons is classified against some scheme set up by your Six Sigma, your lean manufacturing team to know how to improve your factory. If you don't measure it, you can't improve it. And so this process as manual and painful and direct labor involving as it is, is core to how a factory can improve today. But while the goal is important, nobody wants this process. You're trying to get rid of direct labor and reduce the number of people you need in the factory, not add even more tasks to people who are already overburdened. So, but how do you get it? You know, it was never possible to take a neural network and train it to reason like a person and look at all the disparate signals, which are not, they're somewhat ambiguous, and actually come up with what was the problem. And not only what was the problem, what was the problem in my organizational scheme of, you know, man, method, material, um, maybe like sub-reason two, whatever your OEE classification scheme might be for your organization, which are very highly specific. This is now actually different with um, generative AI. So let's like highlight how this could be fully automated now um, with a generative AI tool. So what, what can you do? So actually two places in here where you can solve some pain. So the first pain is using the strength of large language models for just uh, voice, digit, voice annotation and translation. And this is not a, a game changer, but it's just a simplified user experience where you can say, hey, rather than running to a computer and typing in what happened, just speak into WhatsApp, into WeChat, into your phone, See what you saw, and that's it. Goes into an LLM, takes it in the language operator speak, which is usually not English, for example, um, depending on where your factory is located. Lets them speak in the native language, say what happened, writes it down, translates it into whatever scheme or what language your organization uses for classifying these things, and doesn't require them to waste time typing it into a computer. Instant labor savings, but doesn't really change the game yet. But now, let's say you also have um, information on all the details you have from the equipment. You've actually wired up a rich digital twin and you know not only what the people saw, but what the machinery saw. You know the error codes, you know the measurements, you know the reasons, you know which ones are out of parts. Now you can combine these two things together and imagine like filling out a report automatically. Now a text report, person said this, machine said this, here's a product I was building. I know for this product what's required to build it, I have instructions. Ask an LM to reason based on that, what was the downtime and here's my scheme. And it actually works quite well. You can actually go from um, AI voice capture all the way to fully annotated downtime reasons without wasting anybody's time on the shop floor and actually increase the fidelity of data and decrease the amount of time spent capturing it. So this is sort of one example that I like because it's a perennial problem in discrete manufacturing and LLMs actually do, even with current technology, do change the game what you can do in this problem. So let me give like one other example, a different one, but also uh, fairly, fairly common and perennial 
which is condition monitoring or predictive maintenance or predictive quality, any of your alerting tools in the factory. So it's very important. You know, let's say you have all, your, all of your data coming off your equipment and you wanna know, you know, when am I gonna have a defect in an hour? And let's say you have an expert in your factory who knows every time you know, this, this machine does that and that machine does that, and this error code says this, and this sensor says that, that I can predict will, lead, will mean I have quality problems. Okay, that's great. Let me put in those rules, set my sensitivity, and I've got a system that's gonna watch for these things, like think of observability in a software tool, so observability for your factory. And it's, it works great, you need to do it, but perennially it is incredibly hard to make it highly sensitive and highly specific. What does that mean? It means you have a lot of false positives. You can either ignore problems, but typically you tune it to be too sensitive. And so now your experts who are already in, in high demand, they're forced to spend their time triaging all of these low quality tickets where you come in, there may be a problem, but it's probably not a problem. I'm gonna click ignore, but three out of 10 times it is actually a problem and I can't click ignore. It's not a great experience and it wastes people's time, but it was very challenging to fix because there wasn't enough data to train a neural network here. And there was no way to replace the human reasoning here do that first level triage and figure out what actually is worth somebody's time to look at. This is another area where the reasoning abilities of LLMs, the fact that they reason in human-like ways, allows them to put in the, be put in this process in a way that the older machine learning couldn't. So what could you do now? So now you don't replace the handcrafted rules. You still need those. Um, we haven't found a way to automate that. But before surfacing it to a person, you just, again, similar to the downtime example, you create this document explaining, here's everything I know about this problem. Here are the error codes, here's the rules, here's what happened, here's what I know from my digital twin, here's a picture of the factory when it happened. And you ask a large language model, do you, does it seem like a false positive or does it seem like a real alert? And they're actually quite good at filtering out the noise in a similar way to how a human would do it. But even more importantly than that, you can give it feedback just like a person. And you can say, hey, you got it wrong. Last time you gave me an alert is I want to ignore that alert and here's why. Put in a reason. Every time after a change over the alert fires is never right. And the LM can take that and the next time an alert fires, use that information to guide it towards what you wanted. So what you've done is you created a process where you can craft incredibly complex and specific rules, starting from a base set of like, when this happens, do this, very mechanistic, and then learning over time and iterating with an LLM and giving it feedback on what you want to see until it's perfect to you, a way that doesn't uh, waste your expert's time, gives you high quality tickets, is automatically triaged by an AI agent and ensures you're not um, wasting your time clicking the ignore button on this thing all the time, but also getting the high quality critical alerts. And this is the second example where current LLMs without additional training that will only get better, it's already good enough to help you with this problem. And with that, um, I would like to thank everybody for their time and just you know review what we talked about. So we talked about um, discrete manufacturing, talked about digital twin, talked about how important it is that um, you need to have a digital twin before your AI can work on anything. It sees the digital twin, doesn't see your factory because it doesn't have eyes, it only knows what you tell it. There is a challenge in discrete manufacturing where the fidelity of digital twins is not at a very high level typically today. There's a lot more room for improvement there. In areas where you have digitized enough to know what's going on in your factory, there are two perennial use cases, downtime labeling, and condition or predictive monitoring that are amenable to automation with LLMs in a way they were not before traditional neural networks and is possible today with current technology and that will only improve in the future. So thank you very much for your time and look forward to any questions if we have time. Hi, Liz Reynolds, uh, Urban Studies and Planning at MIT. Um, you made a quick remark about, um, and I'm not sure I had this right, but humans on the floor and being able to take humans off the floor. Mm -hmm. uh, to what extent do you think the human eye and observability uh, continues to be important in this process? Yeah. It's critically important. You know, I would say um, when, when I made that comment, I meant more in the aggregate of how many people do I need to run my factory? How many do I have? And if I can make my people more efficient, I can do more with the same number I have today. So in particular, um, even in this example, it's not about, so voice of the machine is one feed into knowing what happens. People's eyes are, there's no substitute for that. You see so much with your human intuition and also you've seen what happened before. You don't get rid of it, but you can 
I guess, reduce the amount of busy work required to get that information out of the person, which frees up their time then for much more useful and value-add activities in the factory. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. So I guess my question would be, um, you know, there are certain industries that already have, you know, that have gone beyond kind of that and in court or, yeah. you know, on off type data that you can collect. Um, and there it's like the data already exists. You can start to put it through this process, see value and continue to invest. Yeah. But for industries that are very concerned with the ROI, but who may not have started to invent and in, invest in the sensor technology, I guess, how have you uh, advised people to get over the hurdle or gotten over the hurdle with people that you've worked with around, okay, I can't, you know, tell you that this is going to save 10% of your, you know, your costs, but. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's a great question. And I guess I would answer it in a couple of ways. So the first one would be um, to the extent that you reduce the amount of time and cost it takes to digitize and get those first sensors in then you reduce the importance of deciding what the ROI has to be because the overall barrier is lower. So that's one thing that generally raises all boats. I'll take a second example. In this one, let's say that you're in an industry where you have nothing from the equipment, no digitization. This use case still works. It's not fully automated. It makes your life moderately better, but then provides you a use case with ROI and benefit by which you could plug in any digitization on a line by line basis, now feeds into a system and instantly add value. It's not something atomic all or nothing. I must do my entire factory all at once. So there's no benefit. I could do it with nothing actually. And then as soon as I add in more, um, you know, more machines or identify based on the information I get from my people, actually here's my biggest area of challenge. It's quality on this machine or it's on this process or this factory even. If you have you know, a large multi-factory footprint, you can then deploy digitization in those particular areas aligned with where you know the ROI is gonna be based on what you've collected already manually or in this sort of simplified way from people. So like I said, I would say in, in the both two ways. One is it doesn't have to be painful to digitize. That's probably like what our experience has been. It's what we specialize in as a company. But then also um, there are ways to do it that don't require an all or nothing approach. We can get started and then see initial benefit and then uh, decide where to invest further based on the results that you find after initial trials. Whenever you try to apply this methodology how do you assess the situation that this is something worth think, going that route or not? Or are you just hitting a rabbit hole? Yeah. So, you know, with these ones, I, I like these, especially the downtime labeling, because it's an activity that typically is already happening in your factory. And so you can immediately assess how much time am I spending on this? What is the quality of my data? Do I actually get full coverage of all of my process lines? Or have I chosen to only do it on maybe a subset because of the complexity and the, and the amount of challenge? And then if I were to get the same quality data or higher quality data, so I can run my current improvement processes with say zero um, operator involvement or radically reduced, how much does that save me to the bottom line? So you typically already have a good cost number for how much, is, how much you're spending on it. And also you know what the value is because you currently have a process around it. So you can then just say, if I take out the cost and I get the same benefit, then where would I, how would I be able to use this? Follow-up question, number of times it could become a process problem too. Yep. So once you figure out the current state yeah. and you propose a solution, the continuous learning that happens leads to a organizational or a process change. Yeah. How much of this, you know, the cost goes down the drain or how easy it's, it's to scale up to the new process yeah. which you come up with? Yeah, so I would say there's not a whole lot of, of retooling in this particular process, right? Um, this applies to generally all factors in discrete manufacturing, regardless of what your process is. This is the method by which you determine how effective it is, what's your overall um, you know, availability of your assets, um, typically part of like an OEE monitoring program for your factory, for example, your overall equipment efficiency. Typically, one of the top level KPIs would go up the organization to at some point in the higher operational chain. Um, and so I guess I will answer that in a couple of ways. So one, uh, it is fairly flexible. That's one of the nice things about LLMs is that they are responding to the prompts that you give them. So just, I'll give you one specific example actually. Um, so let's say you've got a process like this and typical situation, you know, every fourth cycle is slow. Why might that be? Oh, I got to clean a machine every fourth cycle. 
So, okay, that means every fourth time you go down the line, you're gonna have a pause. And technically it's downtime because you, know, you could have put a buffer in there, done something. Um, but it's so painful to have someone label that every fourth time would take so much time. But you know for this product, that's gonna be the case. You just add a line to the prompt to the LLM, every fourth cycle, there will be a slight slowdown. LLM looks at it, you give it a pattern of, of downtimes in the past, and it now adapts to that change and does the automation for you. So it's actually like incredibly flexible in that regard. You can merge what you know about the product, what you know about the process, what you know about the equipment, what you know from the operator. The operator is your ultimate source of truth. But then as you fill in other sources of data, the burden on them becomes reduced because you now have other sources of data fed into the same process that allow you to not always ask them what actually happened. Great talk, thank you so much. Um, in ancient times, which is to say two or three years ago, yeah. <laughs> we would have uh, LGO thesis projects or others that were looking at applying pre-GPT, pre-transformer kinds of NLP mm -hmm. um, to try to take unstructured data, log data, this, that, yeah. and try to get insights out of that and combine it with other data. And we had some prize winning theses, but the conclusion was often, I need to have more structure in that data. Yep. You know, maybe it, and what's fascinating now is now we're in a different age and yeah. here, you know, the voice of the operator, it's text. Yeah. I'm curious what kind of, um, yeah, maybe this it's multimodal. You actually destructure it to put it into here. Yeah. yeah. Um, so now is it even worth it to spend any time trying to structure? Yeah. So the data or you know, what, what is the new landscape? Is it convert right. everything to text and, and now LLMs come or is it a multimodal kind of yeah. synthesized document and, and, and approaches? So I guess what I would say is, um, as I may answer in a couple of ways. So one, there is a new paradigm now that text-based processing is so powerful that actually you're going back. This is not text. You're turning it back into text if you didn't do an LLM, which is <laughs> somewhat crazy, um, but it just works really well. But I would say the other thing here is that this is actually a very structured process, right? What I didn't talk about here is how do you know when there is a downtime? There's actually a whole, there's a, a point application for where the text-based processing can actually reason and say why something happened in a way that was not possible before. But knowing when to invoke it and knowing that, okay, now we have a downtime, how long it was. LM will never tell you that. You need to have the process, have the structured data to know, let's say like, now also what is it generating? A structured data set a structured data set of classified downtimes with durations associated with them and a, and a reason category scheme that allows you to put that into a database and then visualize that at the enterprise level to say, okay, now I will send a person to go fix this category of downtimes because that affects 75 hours of downtime across five plants. So it's not that everything has become unstructured. There is now a point solution for LLMs that solve a thing that used to be done by people on Excel and that can be automated, but the larger body of structured analysis remains the same on the other side. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tim, and thank you again to our audience for all of the great questions, even after lunch. <laughs>